Chapter Six of the Jackknife Man by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six, Bouge. No, siree, buddy," said Peter, shaking his head. "My jackknife is one thing you can't have to play with. There's two things a man oughtn't to trust to anybody: one's his jackknife, and one's his soul." He ought to keep both of them nice and sharp and clean. If I been letting my soul get dull and rusty and all nicked up, it's no sign I'm going to let my jackknife get that way. What I got to do is to polish up my soul, and I guess there ain't no better place to do it than down here where there ain't nobody to bother me whilst I do it. You ain't no idea what a soul is, but you will have some day, maybe. I ain't right sure I know that myself. The shanty boat was moored in Rapp's slough and had been there three days. The cold weather, which continued unabated, had sealed the boat in by spreading a sheet of ice over the surface of the slough, but Peter did not like the way the river was behaving. Between the new-formed ice and the shore a narrow strip of water appeared faster than the cold could freeze it and the ice that covered the slough cracked now and then in long, irregular lines, all telling that the river was rising, and rising rapidly. This meant that the cold snap was merely local, and that up the river unseasonably warm weather had brought rains or a great thaw. There was no great danger of a long period of high water so late in the season, for cold waves were sure to freeze the north soon but the present high water was not only apt to be inconvenient, but actually dangerous for the shanty boat. A rise of another foot would cover the lowland, and if the weather turned warm, Buddy and Peter would be cut off from the hill farms by two miles of water-covered bottom, to wade across which in Peter's thin shoes would be most unpleasant. The danger was that the wind, which now blew steadily toward the Iowa side and downstream, might force the huge weight of floating ice into the head of the slough, pushing and pressing it against the newly formed slough ice and crumbling it, cracked and loosened at the edges as it was, and thus pile the whole mass irresistibly against the little shanty boat. In such an event, the boat would either be overwhelmed by one of those great ice hills that pile up when the river ice meets an obstruction, or, borne before the tons of pressure, be carried out of the slough with the moving ice and forced down the river for many miles, perhaps, before Peter could work the boat into the clear water and find shelter behind some point. The water reached the height of the bank of the slough the third day and Peter made every possible preparation to save the boat should the ice begin to move. There was not much he could do. He unshipped his small mast and drove a spike in its butt to use as a pike pole, stowed his skiff in a safe place between two large trees on the shore, and saw to the hitch that held the boat that he might cast off promptly if the strain became too great. Peter did not blame himself for the position in which the untimely rise had placed him. The slough would have been a safe place. Once let the ice firmly seal the slough, any slough, and all the weight of all the floating ice of the whole river could not disturb the boat. When the ice moved out of the river in the spring, it would pile up in a mountain at the head of the island formed by the slough, choking the entrance and not until the slough ice softened and rotted and honeycombed and at last dissolved in the sun could anything move the shanty boat. A big rise in November is rare indeed. "'But I want your jackknife, Uncle Peter,' said the boy insistently. "'I want to whittle.' "'And I wouldn't give two cents for a boy that didn't want to whittle,' said Peter." A jackknife is one of the things I've got to get you when I go uptown, and I'll put it right down now. From his clock shelf, still lacking its alarm clock, he took a slip of paper and a pencil stub. It was his list of goods to be bought, 
and it was growing daily. Coffee, rubber boots for B, lard, sweater for B, red one, Bible, soap, hymn book, stockings for B, ABC blocks for B, 60 thread, 82. Under this he added, jackknife for B, and replaced the list and pencil. He shook his head as he did so. He had forty cents in his pocket, and the small pile of wooden spoons that represented his trading capital had not increased. Getting settled for the winter had taken most of his time, and while his jackknife was busy each evening, its work was explained by the toys with which Buddy had littered the floor. These were crudely whittled and grotesque animals, a horse, a cow, two pigs, and a cat much larger than the cow, all of clean white maple wood, the beginnings of a complete farmyard. Of them all, Buddy preferred the funny cat, and a funny cat it was. Peter had his own ideas on the question of when a small boy should go to bed, but Buddy had other ideas, and Peter was not sorry to have the boy playing about the cabin long after normal bedtime. When, on the night of the funeral, it became a matter of plain decency for Buddy to retire, and he wouldn't, Peter had compromised by agreeing to whittle a cat if Buddy would go to bed like a little soldier as soon as the cat was completed. The result was a very hasty cat. Peter made it with twenty quick motions of his jackknife, which was putting up a job on Buddy, but Buddy was satisfied. The cat had no ears. It might have been a rabbit or a bear, if Peter had chosen to call it so. It was a most impressionistic cat, but Buddy loved it. "'Ho, ho!' he laughed, throwing his legs in the air, as was his way when he was much amused. "'That's a funny cat, Uncle Peter. Make another funny cat.' "'You go to bed, young Buddy,' said Peter. I said I'd make you a cat, and you say that's a cat, and you said you'd go to bed, so to bed you go. And to bed Buddy went, with the cat in one hand. Next to Peter himself, Buddy loved the cat more than anything in the world. He loved to look at the cat. It was the sort of cat that left something to the imagination. That may be why he liked it. Children are happiest with the simplest toys. In Peter's list of prospective purchases, the Bible had been put down because Peter, watching Buddy's curly head as it lay beside the cat on the pillow of the bunk, had suddenly perceived that a child is a tremendous responsibility. Buddy's hair did it. He noticed that Buddy's hair, which had been almost white, had, in the few days Peter had him in charge, turned to a dirty gray. He had not minded Buddy's dirty face and hands. They were normal to a boy, but the soiled tow hair shamed Peter. Even a mother like Buddy's had kept that hair as it should be, and Peter was shocked to think that he was already letting the boy deteriorate. If this continued, Buddy would soon be no better than himself, a shiftless, as per Mrs. Potter, careless, no-account scrub of a boy, and it made Peter wince. He thought too much of the freckled face and the little towhead to have that happen. It made him downhearted for a minute, but Peter was never despondent long. If the cold chilled his bones, it suggested a trip to New Orleans or Cuba, and he instantly forgot the cold in building one detail of the trip on another until he had circumnavigated the globe and decided he would go to neither one nor the other but to Patagonia or Peru. If that was the way Buddy's hair looked after a few days under the old Peter, then Peter must turn over so many new leaves he would be in the second volume. He would be a tramp no more. He would have money and a home and be a respected citizen with a black silk watch fob, and go to church. And that suggested the Bible. 
With soap and the scripture on his list, Peter felt less guilty. The hymn book was a sequential thought. Bibles and hymn books go hand in hand. Peter meant to start Buddy right, and he was going to begin with himself. He meant now to be a good man and a prosperous one, perhaps a millionaire. His idea was a little vague, including a shadowy Prince Albert coat and a silk hat, but he thought a Bible and a hymn book, at least, ought to be in the stock of a man that was going to be what Peter meant to be. The ABC blocks on the list were to be the cornerstone of Buddy's education, and on them Peter visioned a gilded structure of college and other vague things of culture. Peter's plans were always dreamlike, and all the more beautiful for that reason. He was forever about to trap some elusive chinchilla on some unattainable Amazon. "'Make a funny cat, Uncle Peter,' said Buddy when he was convinced he could not coax the jackknife from Peter. "'Oh, no,' said Peter. "'You've got one funny cat. I guess one funny cat like that is enough in one family. Uncle Peter has to keep his eye out to watch if the ice is going to move this morning. He can't make cats.' "'Make a funny dog,' said Buddy promptly. "'Well, Buddy, if I make you a funny dog,' said Peter, "'will you be a good boy and play with it, and let Uncle Peter get some stove wood aboard the boat?' "'Yes, Uncle Peter,' said Buddy. He had the smile of a cherub and the splendid mendacity of youth. He would promise anything. Only the most unreasonable expect a boy to keep such promises, but it does the heart good to hear them. Peter took a thin slice of maplewood from his pile and seated himself on his bunk. He held the wood at arm's length until he saw a dog in it, and Buddy leaned against his knee. "'Now, this is going to be a real funny dog,' said Peter, as his keen blade sliced through the wood as easily as a yacht's prow cuts the water. "'Suppose we put his head up like that, eh? Like he was laughing at the moon.' two deft turns of the blade. "'And we'll have this funny dog a sitting on his hind legs, eh?' Four swift turns of the knife. "'That's a funny dog,' laughed Buddy. "'Give me the funny dog.' "'Now, don't you be so impatient,' said Peter. "'This is going to be a real funny dog if you wait a minute. "'There, now, he's scratching that ear with his paw.' and he's ready to shake hands with this one, and two or three quick turns of the knife. There he is, cocking his eye up at you, like he was tickled to death to see you had your face washed this morning without howling no more than you did. Ho, ho, laughed Buddy. That's a funny dog. Now make a funny rabbit, Uncle Peter. No siree, Buddy, said Peter sternly. You promised to be good if I made a dog, so you just sit down and be it. When a body makes a promise, he'd always ought to keep it if it ain't too inconvenient. So you stay right here and don't touch the stove or anything whilst I get in some wood. That's my duty, and when a man has a duty to do, he ought to do it, unless something he'd rather do turns up meanwhile. Peter took his shotgun. There was always a chance of a shot at a rabbit. He crossed the plank to the shore, but there was not much burnable driftwood along the slough. What there was had been frozen in the ice, and Peter pushed his way up to where the slough made a sharp turn. In such places abundant driftwood was thrown against the willows at high water, and Peter set his gun against a log and filled his arms. He was stooping for a last stick when a cottontail darted from under the tangled pile and zigzagged into the willow thicket. Peter dropped his wood and grasped his gun and ran after the rabbit, but his foot turned on a slimy log and he went down. He had a bad fall. For a man just beginning a career of superhuman goodness, 
peter swore quite freely as he sat on the log and hugged his ankle grinning with pain it relieved his mind and the rubbing he gave his ankle relieved the pain and he felt better all through when he put his foot to the ground and tried it he limped a little but he grinned too for he knew buddy would be amused to see uncle peter limping like buddy buddy could see something funny in anything peter limped back to his driftwood but as he pushed through the leafless willows he dropped his gun and hobbled hastily toward the shanty boat Forced by the weight of river ice pressing in at the head of the slough, the slough ice was going out, and it was going out rapidly. Already, as far as Peter could see down the slough, the surface was covered with hurrying river ice, borne along by wind and current. In his concern for the shanty boat and Buddy, Peter forgot his ankle. He knew well the power of the ice and he fought his way along the shore through the willow thickets, fearing at each glimpse to see the shanty boat crushed against some great water elm and heaped high with ice, and fearing still more to see nothing of it whatever. Once let the shanty boat find the mouth of the slough and pass out into the broad Mississippi, and he well knew he might have a long fight to overtake it. The boat might travel for days, jammed in the floating ice, before he could reach it, or it might be crushed against some point or in some cove. What would then be Buddy's fate? What, indeed, might not be the boy's fate already, if he had been frightened by the grinding of the ice against the boat, by the snapping of the shore cable by the motion of the boat, and had attempted to reach the shore? Peter beat the willow saplings aside with his arms as he tried to make haste, jumping into them and thrusting them aside like a swimmer. In places the water had overflowed the feet of the willows, and through this Peter splashed unheeding. Once, in trying to keep outside the willow fringe, he would have slipped into the slough had he not saved himself by clinging to the bushes, and he was wet to the waist. Here and there the bank lay a foot or two higher, and there were no willows, but a tangle of dead grapevines impeded him. In other places the shore dipped, and the water stood as deep as Peter's knees, and he crashed through the thin ice into icy water. He did not dare venture back from the shore, lest he pass the shanty boat, stranded against some tree. Cold as the air was, the sweat ran from Peter's face, and he panted for breath. To pass leisurely along the bank of such a slough is strenuous work, but to fight along it as Peter was fighting is real man's work, and Peter, thin, delicate as he looked, was all iron and leather. For a mile and a half he worked his way until he reached a great sycamore, known to all the duck hunters as the big tree. Below the big tree the slough widened into a broad expanse of water known as Big Tree Lake. Peter stopped short. In the middle of the lake, knee-deep in water and holding fast to a worn imitation leather valise from which the water was dripping, stood a man. The shanty boat, thrown out of the main current, had been pushed into shallow water, where it had grounded unharmed, and it was for the shanty boat the man with the valise was making, swearing heartily each time he took a new step in the icy water. Peter yelled, and the man turned and looked back. At the first glimpse of the face, Peter picked up a stout slab of driftwood. The man wore the ragged remnant of a felt hat on a mass of iron-gray hair that hung over his beady eyes, and all his face but his eyes and a round red nubbin of a nose was hidden by a mat of brown beard. When he saw Peter, he scowled and splashed recklessly toward the boat, swearing as he went. The western side of the lake was overgrown with wild rice, a favorite feeding spot for the migrating ducks. 
indeed the entire lake was apt to disappear during very low water, leaving only sun-baked mud, with a slough running along the eastern margin. Through the shallow ice-topped water Peter splashed after the tramp, breaking the ice as he went. Until he was well out in the lake the ice had not been broken, and Peter could not understand this. It was as if the tramp had jumped a hundred yards from the shore. But Peter did not give it much thought. He had something more important to think of. The tramp had reached the shanty boat and had clambered aboard, and with the pike pole Peter had left lying on the roof, was trying frantically to pull the boat off the bar into deeper water. A boat adrift is anyone's boat if he can keep it, and once the boat swung clear of the bar into deeper water, the tramp could laugh at Peter. He rammed the pike pole into the sandbar and threw his weight upon it, straining and jumping up and down while Peter splashed toward him. But the boat would not budge. The pike pole found no grip in the soft sand of the bar, and Peter came nearer, holding up one arm to protect his head. He expected the tramp to strike him down with the heavy pike pole, and he was ready to make a fight for it. But as Peter's hand touched the deck, the tramp put down a hand to help him aboard. "'All right, partner,' he said in a voice so gruff it seemed to come from great depths. "'I'll give you half the vessel. I've been dying for company since I come aboard. It's lonely on this yacht.' Peter grinned a grin he had when he was angry, that made his face wrinkle like a wolf's. "'This is my boat,' he said briefly, and threw open the door. Buddy sat on the floor as Peter had left him, playing with the funny dog. As Peter entered, he looked up. "'My funny dog ain't got no tail, Uncle Peter,' he said. "'Yes, he has, Buddy.' said Peter, with a great sigh of relief. "'He's got a tail, but you can't see it because he's sitting on it.' But Buddy was looking past Peter at the tramp. The man, his thumbs in the torn armholes of his coat, his head on one side, one leg raised in the air, was making faces at Buddy. As Peter turned, the tramp put the toe of his boot through the handle of his valise and raised it, tossing it in the air with his foot. Buddy laughed with glee. "'That's a funny man, Uncle Peter,' he said. "'Who's him?' The tramp stepped aside and put his wet valise on the floor. Then he took off his hat and laid it across his breast and bowed low to Buddy. "'Your Royal Highness?' he said gravely. I am known from near to far as the no less talented stranger who came out of the East and got his permanent set back in the booze. Can you say that? Buddy laughed. Booze, he said. That's a funny name. Peter stood with one hand on the door and the tramp's dripping valise in the other but it was evident Booge did not mean to accept Peter's attitude as an invitation to depart. He went inside and seated himself on the edge of the bunk and pulled off first one wet boot and then the other. He paid no attention to Peter whatever, but from time to time he screwed up his hairy face and winked at the boy. "'My name's Buddy,' said Buddy. "'Buddy?' queried Booge. "'That's a bully name for a little feller. First the bud, and then the flower, and then the apple, green and sour.' Peter had never seen a tramp just like Bouge. He had seen tramps as dirty and as ragged and as hairy, but he had never seen one that little boys did not fear, and it was plain that Buddy was captivated by Bouge's good nature. But a tramp was a tramp, no matter how captivating, and a tramp was no companion for a boy who was to grow up to be a bank president, or goodness knows what, of respectability. He hardened his heart. 
Bouge continued to Buddy, "'You didn't know I was a teacher, did you? Oh, yes, indeed. I'm an educated feller, and I figured to teach you. But it seems some folks want you to grow up just as ignorant as possible. Oh, yes.' Peter hesitated. At any rate, there was no need of making the fellow walk through the ice-covered lake again. "'What can you teach him?' he asked. "'Well, there's Soprano,' rumbled Bouge. "'I can teach him Soprano. That's a good thing for a young fellow to know. Soprano or alto, just as you say, or bass. I can teach bass if the board is good. How is the board on board?' Peter ignored the question. He was trying to guess what sort of strange creature this was. "'Well, if it's as good as you say,' said Bouge, "'I'll teach him all three. That's liberal. I'll give you a sample of my singing.' "'You don't need to,' said Peter. "'When I want any singing, I'll do my own.' "'Well, since you urge it that way,' said Bouge, I can't refuse. And tapping his bare foot on the floor, he sang. He found, somewhere in his head, a high squeaky falsetto. It seemed to dwell in his nose. He sang, Go wash the little baby, the baby, the baby. Go wash the little baby, and give it toast and tea. Go wash the little baby, the baby, the baby. Go wash the little baby and bring it back to me. He let the last word drone out long and thin, and as it droned, he made faces at Buddy, screwing up his eyes, wriggling his nose, and waggling his chin. Sing it again, Bouge, cried Buddy enthusiastically. Sing it again. The tramp arose and bowed gravely first to Buddy and then to the frowning Peter. "'That's enough of that,' said Peter. "'Sing it again, Bouge,' commanded Buddy, and the tramp standing with his hand inside his coat sang in the deepest bass, "'Don't swear before the baby, the baby, the baby. Don't swear before the baby, or cheat, or steal, or lie.' Don't swear before the baby, the baby, the baby. Don't swear before the baby, but give it apple pie. Now laugh, shouted Buddy. Ha, 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 said Bouge, exactly as it is printed. I want your face to laugh, ordered Buddy. Bouge screwed up his thin face, and Buddy looked and was satisfied. Bouge was satisfied, too. He knew Buddy was boss of the boat now, and he knew he stood well with Buddy. End of chapter 6「Thundering cats!' cried Peter, with exasperation, when the tramp had ha ha and grinned through two more verses of the idiotic song. "'I've got to go outside and tend to this boat.' "'You play with your toys a minute now, buddy,' said Bouge, as soon as Peter was outside. "'My voice is such a delicate voice, I got to rest it between songs, or it's liable to get sick and die away for good.' You wait till I rest it, and I'll sing about that funny dog you've got there, if you remember to ask me. He took his few belongings from the valise and hung them before the fire, and then, crawling into the bunk, settled himself comfortably and went to sleep. When Peter came in a minute later, with feet and legs chilled, Bouge was snoring. "'Get up here,' said Peter, shaking him. "'You better not wake up Booge, Uncle Peter,' said Buddy. "'He's got to get his voice rested up.' "'You get up and get your boots on quick, and come out here and help me,'
Peter commanded the tramp. "'We got to get this boat afloat quick, or we'll be here all winter.' "'All right, Captain Kidd,' said Booge cheerfully. "'And you remember to ask me to sing you that song about the funny dog,' he told Buddy. The slough was now free from floating river ice, but Peter noticed that the wind was still from the east. This should have kept the ice running through the slough. He knew the ice must have jammed at the head of the slough, and that it might act as a dam, lowering the water in the slough enough to make it impossible to move the boat. He was working at the pike pole, but with poor success, and when Bouge came out, their combined efforts seemed to accomplish no more. But Peter knew the boat must be moved, and long after Bouge wanted to give it up as a bad job, Peter made him labor at the pole. By standing on the landward edge of the deck and joggling the boat as they pushed on the pole, they succeeded in inching the shanty boat toward deeper water, and at length she floated free and swung down the current. Where the lake narrowed and ended, Peter ran the boat against the shore, letting her rest against a fallen tree. It was a precarious position, and one in which it would not be safe to leave the boat if the river ice ran again, but just above this, where the lake widened, Peter saw a safe harbor. Fifty feet out from the southern shore of the lake, a bar had formed, and between the bar and the shore there was deep water enough to float the boat. To break the ice of this cove, warp the boat around the point and into this snug harbor was Peter's intention. His only cable had snapped close to the boat when she broke away, and he made Bouge hold the bow of the boat close against the bank while he hastily twisted a makeshift rope of trot lines, hooks and all. With Bouge on the shore dragging the rope end, and Peter breaking the ice with his pike pole from the deck, and pushing with the pole, the shanty boat moved slowly out of the current of the slough and into the quiet water, where, as the river fell, it would be stranded with its hull in the mud, as safe from danger as if on top of one of the hills two miles back from the slough. It was hard work, the hardest Bouge had tackled for years, and it consumed the balance of the day. When the two men went inside, Peter did not complain when Bouge threw himself on the bunk. If Bouge imagined he had won an easy and permanent victory, leading to a life of listless ease, he misestimated Buddy and Peter. Buddy alone could have kept him busy, but Peter let Bouge know immediately that if he was to stay even a day, he must earn his food and lodging. The tramp was an odd combination of good nature and laziness, of good intentions and poor fulfillments. He could twang a banjo, when he had one to twang, and his present low estate was due to the untimely end of the career of a medicine show, one of those numerous half-vaudeville, half-peddling aggregations that at that time filled the country charging a dime for admission to the show and a dollar a bottle for the remedy. Out of the hidden past, Bouge had dropped into the position of General Roustabout for the show, caring for the tent, doing a banjo turn when the artist went on his regular spree, and driving the wagon when the show moved from town to town. When the final catastrophe came, Bouge sold his banjo and started on the trail of another medicine show. It fled as he advanced and his garments decayed, were replaced with cast-off clothes, until he awoke one morning with a sharp realization that he was no longer a specialist seeking a position, but a common everyday tramp. It did not annoy him at all. Being a tramp had advantages. He accepted it as his ultimate destiny. Caught near Riverbank by the cold weather, he recalled Lone Tree Lake, where the duck hunters usually had a shack or a shanty boat, vacant at this season, and he left the main road only to find nothing but the scant shelter of the duck blind. Peter's boat, when it appeared, had seemed a gift from the gods. 
The shore against which the boat now lay was a thicket of willows so close of growth that it was almost impossible to fight through them. And while most were no larger than whips, some were as large as a man's wrist. Against the low bank the boat lay broadside, and so close that the willow branches reached over her roof, and as soon as Bouge had brought his valise inside, Peter reached far under the bunk and brought forth an axe. "'Now, Bouge ain't going to have time to sing songs to you daytimes, buddy, because everybody that lives on this boat has work to do,' said Peter. "'And as I've got to make some spoons, Bouge is going to take this axe and clear away a path through the willows. "'And you want to cut them off close down to the roots,' he warned Bouge, "'or you'll have to do it over again. "'You cut a path from the front door through that willow clump.' so we can pass in and out and get firewood, and when you've got the path you can fetch the firewood. I'm going to stay in today and make spoons." Booge took the axe and looked at it quizzically. "'Well, if this ain't my old friend Wood Splitter I've been dodging for years and years,' he said good-naturedly. "'How do, Wood Splitter? How's your cousin Bucksaw? Is all the little bucksaws well? You better get at them willows, said Peter. I just wanted to inquire about them old friends of mine, said Booge. You'll have time enough to talk to Mr. Woodax before you get done with him, said Peter dryly, and Booge laughed and went out. That evening, when Buddy was in bed, Peter put down his jackknife long enough to scribble down the new variations of the Tell the Little Baby song. "'Writin' a book?' Booge asked. "'Writing home to my folks to tell them how much I'm enjoying your visit,' Peter said, "'and how sorry I am you've got to be moving along in a day or so.' But Booge did not move along. After Peter had ostentatiously bathed once or twice, Bouge became painfully clean. He would come in from the jobs Peter set him and wash his face and hands violently. "'You're getting as clean as them fellows that get five dollars' worth of baths at the Y.M.C.A., ain't you?' Peter said scornfully. "'A feller can get lots of things at the Y.M.C.A. for five dollars that he can't get without it,' said Bouge good-naturedly. "'You don't want to knock me all the time, Peter. A horse crops grass one way, and a cow crops it another way, and the Lord is the maker of them all, as the feller said. So long as a man has a clean conscience and a clear eye, he can walk right up to any bull alive, if the bull wants to let him." "'I'm glad you got a clean conscience,' said Peter. "'Maybe that's why you don't worry.' "'If you feed a pig regular, it don't ask to be petted,' said Booge. "'And that's the way with me. But you ought to give me some credit for the way I pitched in and labored in this here driftwood vineyard when you said to. I bet the prodigal son hated to get down to work after his pa's party, and yet he got to be quite a respected feller in his neighborhood. You oughtn't to think a man can't work because he don't. There's lots of fellers never seen the sea that has eat salt codfish. I guess you read that in a book, said Peter. I guess not, said Booge. I never read but one book in my life. I read the Bible, unexpurgated edition, when I was a kid, and it sort of cured me of book reading. There ain't hardly a comfortable word in it for an easy-going man. If the Bible had been published today, it would have got some mighty severe criticism. Booge, said Peter suddenly, how'd you ever happen to become a tramp? How'd you ever happen to become a shanty boatman? asked Booge, grinning, but Peter was serious. I guess you're right about that, he said. I hadn't ought to object to what you are, when I'm what I am. I just let myself slide was how. I had bad lungs was what was the matter with me when I was a kid, 
so my pa bought me a farm and put a man on it to run it for me and i just fooled around and tried to get husky and stout and by the time i was old enough to run the farm father busted and then a certain circumstances took the farm from me and i took to the river it seemed like me and the river was old friends from ever so far back so i stuck to it and it stuck to me and that's the story just run downhill commented booge cheerfully it's funny ain't it that water's about the only thing that don't get blamed for running downhill you and the river sort of run down together what started me was something just about as common as lungs it was wives yes sir plain wives don't mean to say you had two of em asked peter almost said booge i had one half of that many i'm a naturally happy man and i've had all sorts of ups and downs and as near as i can make out a man can be happy in most any circumstances except where he don't give his wife the clothes she wants my notion of hell is a place where a man has fifty wives and no money to buy clothes for him my wife got to going through my pockets every night for money to buy clothes so i skipped out you don't mean to say a woman would rob a man's pockets whilst he was asleep asked peter was that what she done took money from them no the trouble was she didn't find no money to take said booge light on money and strong on breath was what was my trouble he made an expressive drinking motion with his hand booze he said booze done it you ought to quit it peter said you don't seem like a common tramp i wouldn't let you stay here if you was look at the harm booze done you look at what it done when you went to sleep in that duck blind that's so agreed booge i've got me a good shanty boat to sleep in and three square meals a day and a place to practice my voice in but i suppose you mean it got me where i have to listen to temperance lectures from you that was sort of hard on peter although he would not have admitted it he was growing fond of the careless happy-go-lucky tramp booge had a fund of rough philosophy and more than all else he was good to buddy and had not peter resolved to be a different man himself on buddy's account he would have liked nothing better than to have booge make his winter home in the shanty boat but he felt that booge must go the trouble was to drive him away booge would not drive and peter thought of a hundred quite impossible schemes for getting rid of him before he hit on the one he finally decided to put into effect. He had noticed that the farmer on the hill back of the lake, where Buddy had spent the day of his mother's funeral, had a huge pile of cordwood in his yard, and he tramped across the lowland to the farmer's house and dickered for the sawing of the wood. It was a large contract, and Peter, as a rule, did not care to saw wood except in dire straits but he had decided that if he was to be a man of worth he must be a man of work to begin with and the woodpile was opportunity it was while walking home after making his bargain with his farmer friend that he had his happy idea booge must saw wood his food supply would be cut off otherwise he explained it to booge that evening here they were in the shanty boat peter explained the two of them and buddy all eating from the common store of food and that store dwindling daily buddy could not work but peter could and booge must then he explained about the pile of wood a good winter's work for the two of them booge listened in silence he was silent for several minutes after peter ceased talking and then he grinned the man that says he wouldn't rather find a silver dollar in the road than earn five dollars a workin is like that man that got killed with a thunderbolt for careless conversation he said cheerfully 
so I won't say it. Woodson and me has been enemies ever since I became a tourist. I guess I'll have to go. I bet you would, said Peter. Yes, said Booge. I'll have to go up to that farmer's and saw wood. His eyes twinkled as he saw Peter's face fall, and he was as good as his word. The two men, taking turns carrying Buddy or leading him by the hand, walked across the snow-covered bottom to the farm the next morning, and while Booge did not overexert himself, he at least sawed wood. He sawed enough to prevent any unduly harsh criticism from Peter. For Buddy the trips were pleasant jaunts. He was able to play all day with the farmer's little daughter, just enough older than he to hold her own against his imperious little will, and Booge might have developed into an excellent sawer of wood, but one morning the little girl did not come out to play with Buddy. She was sick, and in due time Buddy became sick too, plain simple measles. "'Now then,' said Peter, when one morning he awakened to find Buddy's face covered with the red spots and the boy complaining, "'One of us has got to stay here in the boat and take care of Buddy.' "'You'd better stay,' said Booge promptly. "'You stay, Peter, and I'll go on up and saw wood. I'm getting quite fond of it.' Peter hesitated. He ran his hand over the boy's white head lovingly. "'Who do you want to stay with you, Buddy?' he asked. "'I don't care, Uncle Peter,' said Buddy listlessly. It was a full minute before Peter took his hand from Buddy's curls. "'I guess you'd better stay, Booge,' he said then. "'You can sing what he likes better than I can.' "'Well, if you think I can amuse him better than you can, I'll stay, Peter,' said Booge reluctantly. If he seems to hanker for you, I'll fire the shotgun and you can come to him." So one of these two men went to his work, and the other seated himself on the floor of the cabin, with his back against the wall, and sang, "'Go tell the little baby, the baby, the baby,' through his nose, and made faces to amuse a freckle-faced little boy with a very light attack of the measles. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of the Jackknife Man by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight. Peter gives warning. The weather turned extremely cold. Peter came back from his wood sawing one evening and found Buddy astride a rocking horse. The table was on top of the bunk to make room for the horse, and Booge, robed in one of the blankets was playing the part of a badly scared Indian after whom Buddy was riding in violent chase. For a week Buddy had been well, but Booge managed to make Peter think he could still see spots on the boy. Booge had no desire to begin sawing wood again. It was much pleasanter in the shanty boat with Buddy. The rocking horse was the oddest-looking horse that ever cantered. Among the driftwood, Booge had found the remains of an old rocking chair, and on the rockers he had mounted four willow legs, with the bark still on them, and on these a section of log for the body. With his axe he had cut out a rough semblance of a head and neck from a pine board. The tail and mane were sane twine. But Buddy thought it was a great horse. "'Looks like you was a great sculptist, don't it?' said Peter jealously, as he stood watching Buddy riding recklessly over the prairies of the shanty-boat floor. "'So that's why you've been trying to make me think freckles was measles. It's a pity you didn't have a saw to work with.' Booge looked at Peter suspiciously. "'I guess maybe by tomorrow I can find one for you,' continued Peter. "'I saw a right good one up at the farm.' and quite a lot of cordwood to practice on. "'If you ain't just like a mind-reader, Peter,' exclaimed Booge, 
You must have knowed I've been hankering to get back there at that pleasant occupation. But I hated to ask you. You're so dumb jealous of everything. It's been so long since you've invited me to saw wood, I was beginning to think you wanted a whole job for yourself. You won't have to hanker tomorrow, said Peter dryly. Tomorrow? Now, ain't that too bad, said Booge. Tomorrow's just the one day I can't saw wood. I've been hired for the day. Uncle Booge is going to make me a wagon, said Buddy. Uncle Booge is going to take you up to the farm while he saws wood, declared Peter. Uncle Peter will make you a wagon later on, Buddy. I want Uncle Booge to make me a wagon tomorrow, Buddy insisted. He said he would make me a wagon tomorrow with wheels and a seat into it added booge all right said peter with irritation stay here and make a wagon then but that night when buddy was in the bunk and asleep peter had a word for booge i don't want to hasten you any booge he said trimming the handle of a wooden spoon with great care as he spoke but day after tomorrow you'll have to pack your valise and get out of here. I don't want to seem inhospitable or anything, but when a visitor gets permission to stay overnight to dry his boots, and then camps down and loafs and stays half the winter, and makes wagons and horses there ain't no room for in the boat, he's done about all the staying he's entitled to. Buddy's been asking to have me go again, said Booge. "'No, he ain't,' answered Peter. "'He—' He caught the twinkle in Booge's eye and stopped. "'Let's wake Buddy up and ask him,' said Booge. "'Buddy ain't got anything to say on this matter,' said Peter firmly. "'And I ain't sending you away because you're trying to play off from doing your share of wood sawing either. I'm Buddy's uncle, and I've got to look out for how he's raised.' and I don't want him raised by no tramp, and that's how he's being raised. Every day I think I'll chase you out to saw wood, and every day you come it over me somehow, and I go and you don't. I don't know how you do it, but you're smart enough to make a fool of me. That's why you got to go. Is it? asked Booge placidly. I thought it was because you was jealous of me. Yep, that's what I was just thinking. He's jealous and he don't care nothing for what Buddy likes or wants or... Nothing of the sort, said Peter indignantly. You ain't no sort of example to set the boy. I heard you swear this morning when Buddy stuck a fork into you to wake you up. No man that uses words like you used is the sort of man I want Buddy to be with. Booge grinned. There was no use in rebutting such an accusation. Indeed, he felt he had no call to argue with Peter. Day after tomorrow was a distant future for a man who had lately lived from one meal to the next. Booge believed Buddy would be the final dictator in the matter, and he was sure of Buddy now. "'So I guess you'll have to go,' continued Peter. For a tramp you ain't been so bad, but it crops out on you every once in a while, and it's liable to crop out strong any time. If it wasn't for the boy, I'd let you stay until the ice goes out. I'd got just about to the point where I wasn't no better than a tramp myself, but when... but I've changed, and I'm going to change more. Booge nodded an assent. I can almost notice a change myself, he said. But the way you're going to change ain't a marker to the way I'm going to change. I've been planning what I'd change into ever since I come here. I ain't quite decided whether to be an angel cherub like you or a bank president. I sort of lean to being a bank president. Whiskers look better on a bank president than on an angel cherub. But if you think I'd better be an angel cherub, I'll shave up and make a stab at— You might as well be serious. My mind's made up, 
said Peter coldly. You got to go. Suppose, said Booge slowly, I was to withdraw out of this here uncle competition and leave it all to you. Suppose I let on I lost my singing voice. No use, said Peter firmly. My mind settled on that question. The longer you stay, the harder it'll be to get you to go. I'm giving you till day after tomorrow, because I've got to go up to town tomorrow. We're shy on food. If it wasn't for that, I'd start you off tomorrow. Now, suppose I stop being Uncle Booge. Say I start being Grandpa Booge or Aunt Booge, proposed Booge gravely. I'll get a gingham apron and a caliker dress. You'll get nothing but out, said Peter firmly. You'll be nothing but away from here. The trip to town had become absolutely necessary. Peter had drawn ten dollars from the farmer, and he had some spoons ready for sale. The farmer was going to town, and Peter had at first decided to take Buddy with him but the spoon-peddling excursion would, he feared, tire the boy too much, and he ended by planning to let Booge and Buddy stay in the shanty boat. It was an index to Peter's changed opinion of the tramp that he felt reasonably safe in leaving Buddy in Booge's care. For one thing, Booge was sure to stay with the boat as long as food held out and work was not too pressing. The river had closed, and the boat was solidly frozen in the slough. There was no possibility of Booge's floating away in it. "'I won't be back until late,' said Peter the next morning, as he pinned his thin coat close about his neck. "'And it's possible I won't get my spoons all sold out today. If I don't, I'll stay all night with a friend uptown and get back somewhere tomorrow. And you take good care of Buddy,' for if anything happens to him, I'll hunt you up, no matter where you are, and make you wish it hadn't. Unless this horse runs away with him, there ain't nothing to happen, said Booge. You needn't worry. And, Buddy, if you were a good boy and let Booge put you to bed, if I don't get back, Uncle Peter will bring you something you've been wanting this long while. I know what you're going to bring me said Buddy. "'I bet you do, you little rascal,' said Peter, thinking of the jackknife. "'We both of us know, don't we? Good-bye, Buddy boy.' He picked up the boy and kissed him. "'You don't know what Uncle Peter is going to bring me, Uncle Booge,' said Buddy joyfully when Peter was gone. "'No, sir,' said Booge. "'No, sir,' repeated Buddy. "'Cause I know. Uncle Peter's going to bring me back my mama. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of The Jackknife Man » by Ellis Parker Butler • This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Chapter 9 • A Violent Incident Booge waited until he knew Peter was well on his way. Then he took Buddy on his knee. "'Where is your ma, Buddy?' he asked. "'Mama went away,' said Buddy vaguely. "'Did she go away from this boat?' "'Yes. Let's make a wagon, Uncle Booge.' But Booge was not ready. He considered his next question carefully. "'We'll make that wagon right soon,' he said. "'Was Uncle Peter your pa before your ma went away?' "'I don't know,' said Buddy indefinitely. "'You'd ought to know whether he was or not,' said Booge. "'Didn't you call Uncle Peter pa or papa or daddy or something like that?' "'No,' said Buddy. "'You said you'd make a wagon, Uncle Booge.' "'Right away,' said Booge. "'What did you call Uncle Peter before your ma went away, buddy?' The child looked at Booge in surprise. "'Why, of course I didn't call him at all,' 
he said, as if Booze should have known as much. He wasn't my Uncle Peter then. Your ma just sort of stayed around the boat, did she? No, my mama come to the boat, and I come to the boat, and my mama went away. But Uncle Peter and Buddy didn't not go away. I want to make a wagon, Uncle Booge. Just one minute and we'll make that wagon, Buddy, said Booge. I just want to get this all straight first. What did your ma do when she came to the boat? Mama cried, said Buddy. I bet you, said Booge. And what did your ma do then, Buddy? Mama hit Uncle Peter, said Buddy. And Mama went away, and Uncle Peter floated the boat, and I floated the boat, and I steered the boat. And your ma left you with Uncle Peter when she went away, said Booge. What was your ma's name, Buddy? Was it Lane? It was Mama, said Buddy. But what was your name, insisted Booge. What did you say your name was when anybody said, What's your name, little boy? Buddy, said the boy. Buddy what? urged Booge. Mama's Buddy. Booge drew a deep breath. For five minutes more he questioned the boy, while Buddy grew more and more impatient to be at the wagon-making. Of Buddy's past Peter had, of course, never told Booge a word, but the tramp had his own idea of it. He felt that Peter was no ordinary shanty boat man, and he imputed Peter's silence regarding the boy's past and parentage to a desire on Peter's part to shake himself free from the past. Why was Peter continually telling that he had begun a more respectable life? Peter's wife might have been one of the low shanty boat women, a shiftless mother, and a worse than shiftless wife, running away from Peter only to bring back the boy when he became a burden, taking what money Peter had and going away again. Possibly Peter had never been married to the woman. In digging into Buddy's memories, Booge hoped to find some thread that would give him a hold on Peter, however slight. Booge liked the comfortable boat, but deeper than his love of idleness had grown an affection for the cheerful boy and for simple-minded Peter. If Peter had chosen this out-of-the-way slough for his winter harbor, when shantyboat people usually came nearer the towns, in order that he might keep himself in hiding from the troublesome wife, veiling himself and the boy from discovery by giving out that he and Buddy were uncle and nephew, it was no more than Booge would have done. "'I suppose when your ma come to the boat she slept in the bunk, didn't she?' asked Booge. "'Yes, Uncle Booge,' said Buddy. "'I want you to make a wagon.' "'All right, Beau,' said Booge gleefully. "'Come ahead and make a wagon. "'And when Uncle Peter comes back, we'll have a nice surprise for him. "'We'll shout out at him when he comes in. "'Hello, Papa!' and just see what he says. That'll be fun, won't it?" Booge worked on the wagon all morning. Toward noon he made a meal for himself and Buddy, and set to work on the wagon again. He had found a canned corn box that did well enough for the body, and he chopped out wheels as well as he could with the axe. He wished, by the time he had completed one wheel, that he had told Buddy it was to be a sled rather than a wagon, but he could not persuade the boy that a sled would be better, and he had to keep on. He worked on the clean ice before the shanty boat, and he was deep in his work when Buddy asked a question. "'Who is that man, Uncle Booge?' he asked. Booge glanced up quickly. Across the ice, from the direction of the road, a man was coming. He was well wrapped in overcoat and cap, and he advanced steadily, without haste. Booge leaned on his axe and waited. When the man was quite near, Booge said, "'Hello!' "'Good afternoon,' said the stranger. "'Are you Peter Lane?' 
Bouge's little eyes studied the stranger sharply. The man, for all the bulk given him by his ulster and cap, had a small sharp face, and his eyes were shrewd and shifty. "'Mebbe I am,' rumbled Bouge, crossing his legs and putting one hand on his hip and one on his forehead. "'And maybe I ain't. Let me recall. Now, if I was Peter Lane, what might you want of me?' The stranger smiled ingratiatingly and cleared his throat. "'My—my my name,' he said slowly, "'is Briggles, Reverend Rasner Briggles, of Derlingport. My duty here is, I may say, one that, if you are Peter Lane, should give you some cause only for satisfaction. Extreme satisfaction, yes.' Bouge was watching the Reverend Mr. Briggles closely. "'I bet that's so,' he said. "'I sort of recall now that I am Peter Lane, and I don't know when I've had any extreme satisfaction. I'll be glad to have some.' "'Yes,' said Mr. Briggles, rather doubtfully. "'Yes, I am the president of the Child Rescue Society.' an organization incorporated to rescue ill-cared-for children, placing them in good homes. "'Buddy,' said Bouge roughly, "'you go into that boat, and you stay there, understand?' The child did as he was told. Bouge's tone was one that he had never heard the tramp use, and it frightened him. "'It has come to my attention,' said Mr. Briggles, "'that there is a child here.' You will admit this is no place for a tender little child. You may do your best for him, but the influence of a good home must be sadly lacking in such a place. In fact, I have an order from the court. He began unbuttoning his ulster. I bet you have, said Bouge, genially. So, if you want to, you can sit right down on that bank there and read it. And if it's in poetry, you can sing it. And if you can't sing, and you hang around here for half an hour, I'll come out and sing it for you. Just now I've got to go in and sing my scales. He boosted himself to the deck of the shanty boat and went inside, closing and locking the door. In a moment Mr. Briggles, out in the cold, heard Bouge burst into song. Go tell the little baby, the baby, the baby. Go tell the little baby he can't go out today. Go tell the little baby, the baby, the baby. Go tell the little baby old Briggles needn't stay. Mr. Briggles stood holding the court order in his hand. Armed with the law, he had every advantage on his side. He clambered up the bank and stepped to the deck of the shanty boat. He rapped sharply on the door. "'Mr. Lane, open this door,' he ordered. The door opened with unexpected suddenness, and Bouge threw his arms around Mr. Briggles and lifted him from his feet. He drew him forward as if to hug him, and then with a mighty outthrust of his arms cast him bodily off the deck. Mr. Briggles fell full on the newly constructed wagon and there was a crash of breaking wood. Bouge came to the edge of the deck and looked down at him. The man was wedged into the rough wagon box, his feet and legs hanging over. He was bleeding at the nose, and his face was rather scratched. It was white with fear or anger. Bouge laughed. "'I owed you that,' he rumbled. I owed you that since the day you married me, and now I'll give you what I owe you for coming after this boy. He jumped down from the deck, and Mr. Briggle struggled to release himself from the wagon box. He was caught fast. He kicked violently, and Bouge grinned. If he had intended punishing the interloper further, he changed his mind. The lake lay wide and smooth with only a pile of snow here and there, and Bouge grasped the damaged wagon and pushed it. Like a sled, it slid along on its broken wheels, and Bouge ran, 
gathering speed as he ran, until, with a last push, he sent the wagon and Mr. Briggles skimming alone over the glassy surface of the lake toward the road. Then he went into the shanty boat and closed and locked the door. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of the Jackknife Man by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten Peter Hears News. Peter reached town about noon and set about his peddling at once, going to the better residential sections where his spoons were in demand, and so successful was he that by three o'clock he had but a few left to trade at the grocer's. He made his purchases with great care, for his list had grown large in spite of the refillings of his larder from time to time through the errands in town done for him by the farmer. He bought the Bible and the ABC blocks, and a red sweater, stockings for Buddy, and socks for himself, and the provisions he needed, and a bright new jackknife for Buddy. All these he tied in a big gunny sack except the knife slung the sack over his shoulders, and went down to report to George Rapp, stopping at the post office, where he asked for mail. The clerk handed him, among the circulars and other advertising matters, a letter. Peter turned the letter over and over in his hand. He had a sister, but this letter was not from her. It was addressed in pencil and bore the local postmark. Peter held it to the light, playing with the mystery as a cat plays with a mouse, and finally opened it. It was from Mrs. Potter. "'Now I know all about you, Peter Lane,' it ran, "'and not much good, I must say, although I might have expected it, and I am much surprised and such shiftlessness, and you might have let me know that woman was sick, for I am not a heathen, whatever you may think.' I want you to come and get your clock out of my sight, and if you have time to saw me some wood, I will pay cash. Mrs. Potter Peter folded the letter slowly and put it in his pocket. He knew very well the widow had no cause to single him out to saw her wood, and that she would not be apt to write him for that reason, however much he might underscore cash. That she should write him about the clock was not sufficient excuse for a letter. There was no reason why she should write to him at all, unless the underscoring of that woman meant she had heard how he had taken the woman and her boy in, and it had given her a better opinion of him. If that was so, Peter meant to keep far from Mrs. Potter. He began to fear George Rapp might be right, and that the woman had an eye on him a matrimonial eye. When widows begin writing letters. When Peter entered George Rapp's livery stable, Rapp was superintending the harnessing of a colt. "'Hello!' he called heartily. "'How's Peter? How's the boat? Friend of yours was just inquiring for you in here. Friend from up the river road.' "'She... who was?' "'You guess it,' laughed Rapp. "'Widow Potter. Say, why didn't you tell me you were married?' "'Me? Married to Widow Potter?' cried Peter, aghast. "'I never in my life married her, George.' "'Oh, not her,' said Rapp. "'Not her yet, the other woman. "'You with the boy, three or four years old, "'posing around as a goody-goody bachelor.' But that's the way with you two good fellows. Hope you can keep your little son. My son? stammered Peter. But he's not my son, not my own son. Gee whiz, is that so? said Rapp with surprise. She was that bad, was she? Well, it does you all the more credit, taking him to raise. Anybody else would have sent him to the poor farm, or to old snoozer Briggles. You beat anything I ever seen, with your wives nobody ever guessed you had, and your sons that ain't your sons. 
What makes you act so mysterious? Peter put his gunny sack on the floor. I don't know what you're talking about, George, he said. What is it you think you know? I think I know all about it, said Rapp laughingly. Come into the office. What a man in the livery stable don't hear ain't worth finding out. I know your wife come back to you at the shanty boat, Peter, when she was sick and played out and hadn't nowhere else to go, and I know you took her in and got a doctor for her, and I know she brought along her boy, which you say ain't your son, and I know you sold me your boat so you could take her down river and bury her decent, just as if she hadn't ever run off from you. Who said she was my wife? Who said she run off from me? asked Peter. You tell me that, George. Why, Widow Potter said so, said Rapp. Everybody knows about it. There was a piece in the paper about it. The doc you had up there told it all around town, I guess. And Widow Potter is so interested, she can't sit still. She's just naturally bothering the life out of me. She says she's buying a horse from me, but that's all gee whiz. Anyway, she's dropped in to look at a colt near every day lately, and sort of inquires if you've been up to town. She says she can understand a lot of things she couldn't before. She says she can forgive you a lot of things, now she knows what kind of a wife you had. She says it's some excuse for being shiftless. She's anxious to see you, Peter. "'She ain't in town now, is she?' asked Peter nervously. "'You didn't tell her I was likely to stop in here.' "'I just naturally had to tell her something,' Rapp said. "'She's plumb crazy. She says she's willing to let bygones be bygones, that it's all as plain as day to her now.' "'All what?' asked poor Peter. "'Why, all,' said Rapp everything the whole business why you didn't marry her long ago i reckon she didn't say so in that many words but she spoke about how curious it was a man could hang around a woman year in and year out and saw three times as much wood for her as need be and take any sort of tongue lashing as meek as moses and look kind of marriage like and not do it she said a woman couldn't understand that sort of thing, but it was easy to understand when she knew you had a wife somewhere. She said she's sorry for your loss, and she'd like you to come right up and see her. Rapp lay back in his chair and laughed. "'Did she honestly say that?' asked Peter, very white. "'Did she?' said Rapp. "'You ought to hear what she said.' and me trying to sell her that bay colt of mine all the time. Good withers on this animal, Mrs. Potter. Well, he may be considered worthless by some, says she, but I've studied him many a year, and the whole trouble is he's too good. And he's a speedy colt, speedy but strong, says I. Having a wife like that is what did it, says she. For a wife like that chastens a man too much but I guess he'll be more human now he's gone, and look after his own rights. "'Want the colt?' I says, and she just stared at the animal without seeing him, and says, "'For my part, I'd enjoy having a small boy around the house.' "'Did she say that?' asked Peter. "'She didn't say that.' "'I never told anything nearer the truth,' Rapp assured him. She said that she believed, now, that you were a hopeful proper person to raise a small boy, but that if Briggles was bound to take the boy, she— Briggles? asked Peter breathlessly. Who is Briggles? What has he got to do with it? Don't you know who Briggles is? asked Rapp with real surprise. He used to be a reverend, but he got kicked out, I hear say. He hires a team now and again to take a child out in the country. What does he take children to the country for? To put them in families, Rapp explained. 
and he told Peter how Mr. Briggles hunted up children for the society he had organized, how he collected money and spent the money, and put the children in any family that would take them, and paid himself twenty dollars a child for doing it, charging mileage and expense extra. "'Last time he come down here he had a nice little girl from Derlingport,' said Rapp. "'Her name was Susie. He put her with a woman named Crink.' "'Susie? Susie what?' asked Peter. "'I don't know, but I felt sorry for her. He might as well have put her in hell as with that Crink woman. He'll probably get twenty dollars by and by for taking her out and putting her somewhere else if they don't work her to death. It's God's help the little children but give me the money, so far as I see. He gets an order from the court, just like he did in your case." Peter had let himself drop into a chair as Rapp talked, but now he leaped from it. "'What's that? He ain't after Buddy!' he cried aghast. "'He drove down today,' said Rapp. I told him, but Peter was gone. He slammed the office door so hard that one of the small panes of glass clattered tinkingly to the floor. He slung his gunny sack over his shoulder and was dog-trotting down the incline into the street before George Rapp could get to his feet, for Rapp was never hasty. Along the street toward the feed yard, where his farmer friend had put up his team, Peter ran, the heavy sack swinging from side to side over his shoulder and almost swinging him off his feet. He had spent more time at Rapp's than he had intended, but he met the farmer driving out of the feed yard and threw the sack into the wagon bed. "'Whoa up!' said the farmer, pulling hard on his reins, but Peter was already on the seat beside him. "'Get along!' he cried. I want to get home. I want to get home quick." Through all the long ride Peter sat staring straight ahead, holding tight to the wagon seat. The cold wind blew against his face, but he did not notice it. He was thinking of Buddy, of tow-headed, freckle-faced, blue-eyed, merry Buddy, perhaps already on his way to a good home, like the good home to which Susie had been condemned. There were no hills, and the horses, with their light load and a driver with several warming drinks in his body, covered most of the distance at a good trot, but when the track left the road to avoid the snowdrifts that covered it in places and the horses slowed to a walk, Peter longed to get down and run. It was long after dark when they reached the gate that opened into Rapp's lowland, and Peter did not stop to take his purchases from the wagon. He did not wait to open the gate, but cleared it at one leap and ran down the faintly defined path between the trees and bushes as fast as he could run. Years in the open had mended the weak lungs that had driven him to the open air, but long before he came in sight of the shanty boat his breath was coming in great sobs, and he was gasping painfully. But still he kept on, falling into a dog-trot and pressing his elbows close against his sides, breathing through his open mouth. The path was rough, rising and falling, littered with branches and roots. The calves of his legs seemed swelled to bursting. Time and again he fell, but scrambled up and ran on until at last he caught sight of the light in the cabin boat window. He stopped and leaned with his hand against a tree, striving to get one last breath sufficient to carry him to the boat, and as he stopped he heard the shrill falsetto of Bouge, "'Go wash the little baby, the baby, the baby. Go wash the little baby and give it toast and tea. Go wash the little baby, the baby, the baby. Go wash the little baby and bring it back to me.' It was Buddy's supper song. "'Sing it again, Uncle Booge, sing it again,' came Buddy's sharply commanding voice, and Peter wrapped his arms around the tree trunk 
and laid his forehead against it. He was happy, but trembling so violently that the branches of the small elm shook above his head. He twined his legs around the tree to still their trembling, and hugged the tree close, for he felt as if he would be shaken to pieces. Even his forehead rattled against the bark of the trunk, but he was happy. Buddy was not gone. He clung there while his breath slowly returned, and until his trembling dwindled into mere shivers, listening to Booge boom and trill his songs, and to Buddy clamor for more. And as he stepped toward the boat, Booge's voice took up a new verse, one Peter had never heard. We took the old kazoozer, kazoozer, kazoozer. We grabbed the old kazoozer and tore his preacher clothes. We kicked the old kazoozer, kazoozer, kazoozer. We scratched the old kazoozer and smote him on the nose. Peter opened the door. Buddy flew from his seat on the bunk and threw himself into Peter's arms. "'Uncle Peter! Uncle Peter!' he cried. "'Did you bring me my mama?' "'No, buddy boy,' said Peter gently. "'She's off on the long trip yet. We mustn't fret about that. Ain't you glad Uncle Peter come back?' "'Yes, and—and and Uncle Booge made me a wagon,' said Buddy. "'And it got broke.' "'A uh, feller sort of fell on it explained Booge carelessly, and busted it. He come visiting when we wasn't ready for company. Peter listened while Booge told the story of Mr. Briggles's arrival, reception, and departure. And he falled on the wagon and broke it, said Buddy, and Booge slided him, and Booge is going to mend my wagon. Maybe Uncle Peter will mend it for you, Buddy said Booge. I guess Booge has got to take a trip, like your ma did, tomorrow. You couldn't talk sense if you tried, could you? said Peter with vexation. You are going to stay here every bit as long as I do, ain't he, buddy boy? End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of the Jackknife Man by Ellis Parker Butler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven The Return of Old Kazoozer. I'm much obliged to you, Peter, said Booge after a minute, but I'm afraid I can't stay. I got a telegram saying Caruso's got a cold, and I've got to go to New York and sing Grand Opry. "'You're real welcome to stay,' said Peter, warming his hands over the stove. "'I'd like you to stay. That feller is sure to come back.' "'He's got a court order,' said Booge. "'I guess he heard you was so kind-hearted you'd hand Buddy right over to him and say, "'Thank you, mister.' "'I surprised him.' Booge looked at Buddy, playing on the floor. "'Ain't it funny how you get attached to a kid?' he asked. "'I was just as mad when that old kazoozer said he was going to take Buddy as if he was after my own boy instead of yours.' "'I guess they think this ain't a good enough home for him,' said Peter. He looked about the cabin with new interest. To Peter it had seemed all that a home need be, and he had been proud of it and satisfied with it but now it looked poor and shabby. There were no chairs with tidies on them, no chairs at all. There was no piano lamp, nor even a hanging lamp with prisms. No carpet, not even a rug. It was not a good home, it was only a shanty boat, not much better than any other shanty boat, and it was not even Peter's shanty boat, it was George Rapp's. Booge was ramming his belongings into his valise. "'Not a good enough home?' he growled. "'What do they want for a home? A town hall or an opera house?' "'It's all right for you or me, Booge,' said Peter. 
but what would be a good home for a couple of old hard shells like us ain't what a boy like Buddy ought to have. I'll bet we're eight miles from a Sunday school. My, my, said Bouge. I wouldn't have remained here a minute if I thought I was that far from Sunday school. And we're two miles from a woman. A boy like Buddy ought to be nearer a woman than that. When I was a little tyke like him, I was always right up against my ma's knee. And look how fine you turned out to be, said Bouge. Well, a place ain't a home unless there's a woman in it said Peter gravely. I can see that now. I thought when I built this boat I had a home, but I hadn't. And when I got Buddy, I thought I had a home for sure, but I hadn't. I never thought there ought to be a woman. I went at it wrong end, too. I'd ought to have looked up a woman first. Then I could have got a house, and the boy would tag on somewheres along after only it wouldn't have been Buddy. I guess I'd rather have Buddy." Bouge snapped his valise shut and looked about for any stray bit of clothing belonging to him. "'You won't have him if you don't look out,' he said. "'You'd stand there until that old kazoozer came back and took him if I'd let you. Of course, if you're the sort to give him up, I ain't got a word to say.' "'I ain't that sort,' said Peter hotly. "'If that man comes back, I've got the shotgun, ain't I?' "'Of course,' he said more gently, "'unless Buddy wants to go. "'You don't want to go away from Uncle Peter, do you, Buddy?' "'No,' said Buddy in a way that left no doubt. "'I can't do anything until that man comes back,' said Peter helplessly. Maybe he won't come. Don't you fret about that. He'll come, said Bouge, grinning. He's got my address and number scratched on his face, and I'd ought to clear out right now, but you see how I've got to help you out when trouble comes. You're like a child, Peter. You and Buddy would do for twins. When old Kazoozer comes back, he'll bring a wagon load of sheriffs and a cannon or something. What would you do if you come to me with a peaceable court order and got thrown all over a toy wagon? If he can shoot, I can shoot, said Peter. I bet. And get Buddy shot full of holes? We've got to skedaddle and scoot and vamoose. Listen. In the silence that followed, they could hear voices, a number of voices and Buddy crept to Peter's side and clung to his knee, frightened by the tense expression on the two uncles' faces. Peter stood with one hand resting on the table and the other clutching Buddy's arm. Suddenly he put out his free hand and grasped his shotgun. Bouge jerked it away from him and slid it under the bunk. "'You idiot,' he said. "'What good would that do you? Listen. Have you got any place you can take the kid to if you get away from here? I've got a sister up near town. All right. Now, I'm going to sing, and whilst I sing, you get Buddy's duds on, and your own, and be ready to skin out the back door with him. I can hold off any constable that ever was, long enough to give you a start anyway, and then you've got to look out for yourself. Peter hurried Buddy into his outer coat and hat, and Bouge searched the breadbox for portable food, as he sang in his deepest bass. He crowded some cold corn cake into Peter's pocket and some into his own as he sang, and as his song ended he whispered, "'Hurry now! I'm going to put out this lamp in a minute, and when it's out you slide out of that back door. Quick, you understand?' He let his voice rise to his falsetto. "'Sing it again, Uncle Bouge,' he cried, imitating Buddy's voice. "'No, Buddy's got to go to sleep now,' he growled, 
and the next instant the shanty boat's interior was dark. "'Scoot!' he whispered, and Peter opened the rear door of the cabin and stepped out upon the small rear deck. He stood an instant listening and dropped to the ice, sliding in behind the willows, and the next moment he was around the protecting point and hurrying down the slough on the snow-covered ice, with Buddy held tight in his arms. He heard Bouge throw open the other door of the boat and began a noisy confab with the men in the shore. Bouge was bluffing, telling them they had lost their way, that they had come to the wrong boat, that there was no boy there. Peter had crossed the slough and was on the island that separated it from the river when he saw the light flash up in the shanty boat window. He slipped in among the island willows and crouched there, listening, but he heard nothing, for he was too distant from the boat to hear what went on inside, and he pushed deeper into the willows and sat there shivering and waiting. It was an hour later, perhaps, when he heard Bouche's voice boom out, deep and cheerful, repeating one song until his words died away in the distance. "'Go tell the little baby, the baby, the baby. Go tell the little baby, we won't be back today. Go tell the little baby, the baby, the baby. Go tell the little baby, they're taking Booge away.' "'Come now, buddy,' said Peter. "'We can go back to the boat.' Uncle Booge says there ain't nobody there now. End of chapter 11